Welcome everyone to Accessible SVG Pattern Color Contrast and Motion Considerations. It's a long title, um, but essentially we want to get to the heart of accessible SVGs and hopefully make them a little bit more inclusive for your end users. Thomas was just saying, my name is Carrie and that's what I'm up to these days. What I look like is I have a short-ish blondish hair um, and blue eyes. And <laughs> I, I joke that I, I am not a Wookiee. I am not a princess. I'm probably something in between uh, the two, but I'm in my home office in Wisconsin, Southern Wisconsin. So uh, shout out and hello to all you uh, Wisconsinites and Midwestern uh, people that love New York so much that we have to join the New York uh, group as well. Welcome. All right. So today, just a really quick overview. We're going to be talking about patterns, color contrast, <laughs> animation and doing some wrap up and Q&A. So if anyone went to the ID24 session that I did on SVGs, I really got into more of the heart of when do you use an SVG, the advantages, disadvantages. I got into some kind of high level things about patterns. We didn't talk too deeply about it, but it was all more like data and information. So this one tonight, I wanted to focus on the same overall concepts can't change some of the fundamental foundational SVG nuances and, and good things about SVGs. But what I could do is walk you through the process of creating an accessible SVG. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start out with a demo. So if you feel like you want to uh, play along at home, you should have access to these code pens. My noticed uh, link to all the slides will also include all of these as well. So I've not done it like this before. This is a fun experiment. Let's hope the demo gods are on our side. And I did this in the right order. All right, so here's the first demo here. So I heart New York, iconic New York uh, logo. I took it from, and you can see right over here where I got it from, the Wiki Commons. The first step to making an accessible SVG is that... <laughs> You can legally use it, but you've either created it in some sort of drawing program like Adobe Illustrator, uh, InDesign, that sort of thing, or it's something that's in the commons, or in this case, like it's a demo, so I'm not as worried about it, but I did want to reference where this was. And so if you go to that link, if you get into that CSS, you can grab that SVG, you can export it, and what you end up with is this that's on the side, this HTML. It's just a bunch of code and I'm just scrolling through nothing very exciting unless you can read SVG code, right? So basically it, SVGs are scale vector graphics. So essentially they're visual code. So what these things are that you're seeing with all the dots, they're essentially points on the grid where something is being drawn or filled in or shaded. So depending on what the SVG is doing, typically like in an SVG, like we have here, we're going to probably be breaking it up into letters. Like this is a pretty simple SVG in the sense of right now, especially it's simple because we don't have not added anything to it, but this I is its own kind of component. The heart is the N, the Y, and the R. So if you're building something that's a little bit more complex, your SVG, or you're exporting it from many of the SVG creation templates or SVG gator or something like there's a lot of different complexities but again, going simple, kind of thinking of the, about kind of the base code. So that's what we have here. So I just noted in all of the CSS, some little notes. I'm going to have links in there as well. So this is like SVG 101. We got something, we exported it as an SVG, or we created something as an SVG. We grabbed the code. In this case, I popped it into code pen. That's it. So that was step one, make sure that you own it or that you've drawn it and that you can use it. But now we're going to move on to patterns. We have a lot of pattern options when it comes to pretty much everything. seems like we're getting new patterns all the time as we get new frameworks and that sort of thing. So what I wanted to look at and focus on were just the specific SVG patterns considerations first. So the first step is pretty simple. Some considerations, options. So again, if we've got... 15, 20, 30 options for patterns. Really the first question I'm asking myself, what information needs to be conveyed about this image? So just like images on websites or apps or whatever, you want to have an alternative description if it has information or you decide it's decorative and you want to hide it from the screen reader. So that's the first kind of major question is what kind of information needs to be conveyed? 
If we think it's decorative SVGs, of course, scale vector graphics, by default, most AT devices like screen readers will ignore it because it's just code. There are some, and some certain situations, especially with IE, that it would focus on it when you don't want it to focus on. So you can add some additional ARIA, like an ARIA role equals presentation to hide it. Or you could say something like ARIA uh, hidden, but just be careful with ARIA hidden as we know it hides everything uh, inside of it. So if you had any information nestled in between your SVG that you did want to convey, it would just be gone. You couldn't see it. You couldn't hear it. So that's a major first question. Also, this question makes me think, do I have a simple SVG or do I have a super complex SVG? So if I have a simple one, I'm thinking in terms of simple alts, just like you would have on an image. But if you have something like an infographic where you have a lot of information that needs to be conveyed, the really cool thing about SVG is that you can embed that inside of the actual image itself, but you have to decide and there's different techniques or patterns that you would choose based on whether or not you're doing something simple or doing something more complex. Um, I mentioned that as well, that not only are you asking about what information, you're also saying, what am I supporting? Who am I supporting? What browsers, what tools, what ATs? Definitely AT support is a big uh, consideration. But also environment. So I've come from, so I've been a, I'm a recovering front end developer. I started off in CMS world and higher ed. So we did a lot with Drupal and WordPress and things like that. And so within those kinds of frameworks, we're a lot more limited on what we can change code wise. Either we're getting it from somebody like a module or we're getting something from like the core base that I can't modify. And so sometimes there are limitations. The other part of that is that user limitation. And the user limitation in this case could be even just like your fellow devs. So if, can they copy and paste a pattern and actually like change the ID and, and connect the dots appropriately? Or are you gonna maybe choose a more simple technique to convey your alternative information because that might be a barrier for them? So those are like the top three things. So I created a matrix. I got to update it. I always like it when I get to go back in and check things out. But what this matrix is, and I looked at it just yesterday and updated it. And just for you, I added an additional three uh, patterns, but I wrote an article about SVGs. And what I did is I compared the different patterns that were popular that I found out in the wild. And as I scroll down here, the first ones are just talking about the IMG tag. And essentially, if you're talking about that, if you're thinking about that, it's going to behave very much like you just would uh, be linking out to JPEG or ping because it's that IMG tag that is critical in this particular case. I got a little pushback on number two, changing it and literally only adding the role equals IMG. But when I show you the matrix down below, you'll see why we had to add that because of the silly little bug that's been half resolved, half not, but it's not going to hurt to add it in there. It is a little bit redundant in theory. We just know that in real life and real practice that it actually is needed for a couple of different scenarios. So that's why that one's in there, but we're going to ignore those today. We're really going to focus on the SVG. What I'm doing here is I'm thinking about our I Heart New York logo and what kind of information I want to convey to my user about that, the visual information to somebody who maybe can't see that the logo. And I know it's not super complex, so I'm probably going to be just looking at some of these patterns, the basic ones. Using the SVG tag, because I know I'm going to change stuff within the tag, like I know I'm going to add some different color and I'm going to add some animation. So I want to make sure that I pick one of these that's applicable instead of linking out because I have less control on the CSS. These are the extended description ones. And I'm not reading them all out. It's just a bunch of uh, code, but definitely we have that link. I hope <laughs> for you all, you can take it out, check it out. I added since I, I wrote about this earlier this year, which was everyone kept asking me about ARIA label because I focused on ARIA labeled by and described by in the extended description. So I went ahead and did an ARIA label for them as well. So those are three bonus ones. The image source, of course, and I won't, I won't uh, tell you what that one is, but this is based off of uh, an old song. All right, so the first four, again, like I said, we don't necessarily have to look at because those are IMG tags linking out to an SVG. And since we wanna modify the SVG with CSS, I need to have that 
in the code where I can modify it. I can change it. I don't linking out doesn't do me good unless I have multiple SVGs that I'm linking out to, but that's a lot of work. So in this case, I'm going to be focusing on pattern five, six, seven, eight, because we know that those are the basic ones. Nine, 10, 11, 12 are more complex. And then 13 is actually basic. It, it was the one I added with the ARIA label and 14 and 15. So this is a big matrix. I don't know if I can just scroll a little bit. Yeah, there we go. So again, we're focusing on five, six, seven, eight. We'll go back up to see what those options are. But what I want to see is which pattern has the most support, which SVG pattern. Again, we could be looking at this one too. So scroll down. I won't move too fast. Spoiler alert, number six is awful. Don't use it. I had all kinds of fails, but you can see that I'm having problems here with number seven as well. So I'm kind of scrolling through. It's just showing a description. If it has a green background with a star, then we know that's good to go. If we have a caution sign with a yellow background, then we know use caution. And then the red with a stop hand, we know don't use that. And so I added both the color background, but then for people who are colorblind, you have the icon that you can look at as well. And it's in a table format, so it should be pretty accessible. I, I tested it with my screen reader, but I'm not a native screen reader user. So definitely if you see anything uh, that needs to be addressed, please let me know. Anyway, so I keep scrolling because I've done a lot of additional things to the matrix as well. So combinations of browser and screen reader. Anyway, you get the point. So I decided for this particular demo that I wanted to use uh, example five. Scroll up slowly. Sorry, I have a lot of data in there. Close your eyes. All right, there you go. I went with number five. And the reason why I went with five is because it was really robust support and it was super simple. All I had to add was that title tag. And again, because we don't need to add additional information that's enough for our particular uh, demo. All right, so here we go. Here is the one. So what I did the first time, I just kept everything the same that I got from the export from Wiki Commons, right? Not a big deal. This one I added, and SVGs aren't super accessible right out of the, the box a lot of times, or they might choose different pattern that you don't want to use. So that's why you have to go in. And because it's code, it's not... Uh, just design, you can easily go in and modify it if you're comfortable with code. And so I added the role of IMG because I know that's something I need. And then I added a basic title. So in my case, I said, I got iconic, I love New York logo with black uppercase letters and a red heart. So it gives a little bit, that's all I did technically in, in this section. There's a little bit of, of body and link text or link, link styling, but nothing too complex there and some links. All right. So that's a matrix. Uh, that was step two. And then we move on to color and contrast. So right now we've done pretty basic stuff. We basically just said, Hey, we have found an SVG. Let's give it an IMG tag. So we can tell screen reader and AT users, Hey, this is an image. And then we gave it essentially an alt. So SVGs, again, they're, they don't have a true ALT, like an alt attribute. They don't use that. They have their own tags is what they're called. So there's title and description, I think are the main ones. There might be a, a couple of different ones in there that could also convey information, but you can also add things like the ARIA label labeled by and uh, described by. And now we're going to talk about color considerations. So like all things color, we want to make sure that, and this is newer in the 2.1 WCAG guidelines that essential images also must meet that color contrast ratio of three to one. And so that means that essential means is that if I totally got rid of the image, what changes is it necessary? I think one of a really good example are down in the footer of a website. Usually you have like social media icons and a lot of times they just stand alone as icons um, and don't have additional tech right next to them. So if they disappeared, would you be able to link out to Twitter or, or uh, Instagram or something if those were gone? So that's what I think about essential. There are like everything in, in WCAG, there are always like outliers and exceptions. So definitely take a look at that, but you're looking for non-text contrast for this particular one. So let's assume our SVG is essential. Uh, we want to definitely meet that ratio. 
mentioned here, there are many, many tools. I won't go through all the tools or any tools really that you can use. I feel like people can figure that out, but use the tool. Basically, you want to make sure uh, that you are testing that. The one really cool thing, and we will talk about that inside of that step three, is prefers color scheme. And that's supported by 92 to 93% of all browsers. And so the really cool thing about that, and we'll, I'll show you a demo real quick, is that, okay, it's highly supported, but it's also giving your users an alternative experience. We see it a lot. We've heard probably, you've heard about like dark mode, light mode. That's essentially what prefers color scheme is. It's a super easy way to add uh, CSS media query to your code and essentially give you a whole brand new experience, like almost the alternate experience if you're really going from light to dark. There are no, you can also go light, uh, dark to light to dark. So depending on how you start, it is really important to note that you can't say like the dark mode is your accessible mode. They both have to be accessible. So if you're talking about motion, if you're talking about color contrast, you're talking about alternative information for the visual, non-visual users and low vision people, then you want to make sure that is on both your dark and your light mode. So hopefully that makes sense. All right. So here we are in step three. And, oh, I'm actually in dark mode. I was going to ch change it over. So you can see already between number two and number three here that it changed from the light background and the dark words to the opposite. So this could really look like anything that I wanted it to. Now we finally start to get a little bit more into the code. So the first thing I definitely do is I go through and I clean out anything that I'm going to be using. So originally our IDs, we had some really interesting IDs like numbers and letters, nothing that's substantial or that I know, hey, that's the heart. So I go through and I update the IDs as needed on the areas that I'm going to be updating. So in this case, I added an ID of heart or changed it. And then I recreated the style that was already inherent to that SVG, and I moved it over to the CSS. So those styles are often just baked right in, and it makes sense, baked into the SVG, because they can be used as standalone images that you just link out to. So they need that styling in there. But if you want to modify the styling like we are here, then we need to take those styles out and we need to pop them in the CSS so we can actually do something with it, right? So I just renamed my IDs and then I gave them some styles over here. So it replicates exactly what we had before. And then I added a prefers color scheme dark. So what that essentially is doing is that I have made it, I have made a light mode or that's my default is the light mode, but I want to, when somebody's in dark mode, change it to the reverse. So I'm gonna show you real quick switching over. So I am on a Mac. And I go to my general settings and you might've seen this. If you do auto, it usually defaults to um, whatever is presented first. So if you start out with dark, that's what it'll show you. So I just press my light button here, I'll throw this away. And you can see that was the original style. And then just by changing my operating system option. So I'm saying I prefer as a user to have dark mode. And then that's why it swaps. And like I said, it could be, we can make this any color we want to, right? We could come in here and go purple or something. We could change whatever it is that we wanna do as long as we pick the right hex value or name. So we can play around with Phil, F-I-L, not like my, my coworker Phil, but the other Phil, that's what you, you'll see a lot. So that's just something that's adding the color. So in this case, I'm saying, hey, this is the color I want it. And then the opacity, like how solid I want it to be in stroke, it would be like that outline that's on there. So that's like the general basic SVG options that we see a lot, but there's actually a link to, to in this one up here too. It was this one. Yeah. CSS tricks. There's a really great article about all the different styling options for SVGs, especially if you want to keep it simple and keep it in the CSS. And that's a really good resource. All right. So we talked about pattern choice. We talked about color contrast and all those considerations. And now we're moving on to animation. 
An animation could be simple, like a small motion. It could be something complex where you've seen really cool SVGs where parts of them move or different things do different things, right? It's pretty amazing. Some of the complex animation styles that are out there that are available to us with JavaScript, of course, and CSS even. So the first kind of Number one, I always ask, is this movement necessary? So these are the top three things that I think about when I talk about SVG animation. So really be selective. Do I really need that animation? Do I really need that micro movement? And then you pause and you're like, do I really need that? Most of the times you don't really need that kind of animation. Even if you don't have problems with uh, movement on the screen, it can be annoying too. So just pick and choose. Don't make your whole site SVG. I'm laughing because like my profile site, my demo site is got a lot of SVG uh, funness, but I also do have that alternative of prefers reduced motion, which we're just going to talk about. So WCAG, of course, has some rules around motion and flashing, strobing, that sort of thing. So we hope that the animation isn't so great that you're even in that strobing or flashing range, but well, that's serious stuff that can cause seizures that can cause migraines or like really physical reactions. You can really hurt someone. So we have to be really careful on that, but motion is secondary and as important as that kind of flashing, because you really can trigger someone to have motion sickness or vestibular disorder. They might get a migraine, right? There's a lot of things that motion um, animation can be difficult also for people with attention deficit disorders where they can get distracted and forget why they even are at your site. So definitely look at the WCAG rules after you've decided, hey, we really do want this. Oh, and the last one, I already talked about that. Refers reduced motion supported by 94% of browsers. So it's it's just a little bit edge uh, across. So it's really funny when I first started learning about SVG prefers reduced motion and color scheme. I think we were in like the eighties or seventies, even like late seventies of browsers saying, yes, we are going to support this. So 94 has come a long way in a very short amount of time. So it's really promising. And there's other media queries that are out there that are hopefully maybe going to be implemented soon. Um, and by soon, how the pace of W3C and everything and all the rules, it takes a little bit of time, but there's some really interesting, promising things beyond those two. All right. So step four, I'm trying to go through so we can chat more at the end there. So step four, we're going to add the movement. So if you see this, I'm still in dark mode. Let me go ahead and switch back to light mode for you. I got some sort of bar in there. Hmm, let's refresh that, see if it goes away. Ah, there it goes. <laughs> uh, when in doubt, right? This demo is super simple. And again, I will, will say in case anyone has a vestibular disorder or some sort of motion uh, sickness, that there is a very slight movement to the color. So the color on the iHeart New York logo is changing from the traditional red color and it's cycling through a rainbow of colors because why not at a rainbow? But the major things on here that I've added is that animation, you'll see the animation below. So again, this is simple CSS animation. I called it rainbow. I decided I wanted it to be going for 25 seconds. It's linear and infinite. So that means it's gonna go in order and it's gonna go on forever, which according to WCAG, as we know, <laughs> we don't want things going on forever. We definitely don't wanna loop that much. So here's the keyframes. And again, it's what it's saying is at this, at 0% of that 25 seconds, you know, to fill that heart with this color. So this first color is like the base red that it started with. And then it kind of changes. I probably should have said on the side here exactly what color. The rainbow is that Roy G. Biv. So it goes through that process all the way down to the end. And then it cycles back up because it's infinite. If we had it not on a loop, if we had it finite, then it would only cycle through once and then stop. But again, we're exceeding the guidelines for WCAG uh, movement because we're exceeding uh, that five second rule. And so by that, we need to have giving our users options to pause, stop, or hide that kind of movement. There is the alternative or an additional way that you can do it is with the prefers reduced motion. So on step four, we added the animation. 
on step five, what we're doing is actually giving our users another option to stop the animation. So if I scroll down here, animation, we saw our, okay, yep. And there's our color scheme, steam, color scheme dark. But above that, we have that media prefers reduced motion and reduce. And so if I went into my settings again, and grab it on settings. Zoom has too many open. Let's see. Let's see if I can move this. Sorry, the toolbars in the way. There we go. So the prefers reduced motion is not in the general setting. It's under accessibility. And it's under display. And it's under reduced motion. So immediately when I pressed that, we saw that the heart color stopped. It just went to the default. And what it's doing is it's ignoring all the animation because we told it to, and it's defaulting to that heart color, which is the red. It used to be that you had to reset your page like to see the change in the motion, but now it's pretty instantaneous. But if you don't see it right away, uh, just do a refresh on your page. It could be um, partially that. So I'm gonna go ahead and reduce that motion. It's really interesting. Tatiana Mack had a really interesting article a year or so ago about flipping the idea of the starting point. So instead of starting with animation and then saying prefers reduce motion, reduce, we could do prefers reduce motion, no preference. And so we would start with no animation, but if someone in their settings had not checked that box of prefers reduce motion, then they serve up that motion. So it's a different way to think about it. And I really like that kind of concept that why are we starting with the animation? Like we've already established that it's annoying for some people make other people sick. So let's maybe think about flipping that on its head and really maybe we want to start this one next time with the animation stopped and then add it as we want it or as the user wants it. So that's the step four and five. And I broke that up so we could have a little bit more space to see that difference of that flip and then the add. So it's an interesting concept. I know it's a little bit hard to get uh, your head around it. At least for me, it was when I first heard of that concept. All right. So I went a little bit faster than I probably should have because I've already gotten to the, the Q and A. Maybe that allows for a little bit more questions or can dig into the code if someone's interested a little bit more. But I want to make sure I have a plenty of time to do demos and talk about any of that as well. Oh, oh, sorry. I do have a wrap up. Patterns, a lot of pattern options, picking one for your environment AT support. And that color contrast, you saw that with just a few more lines of code, we can accommodate more of our users' visual needs. And of course, animation, same kind of concept. We've added a little bit more and we've really enhanced the experience because that's really, it's all, it's all about. So it's like Tim Berners-Lee was always saying things about the web and the web as I envision it, we have not seen it yet. The future is so much bigger than the past. And that's where I feel like SVGs and just user choice in general for web and app, that's the future. And this is one small step towards that brighter, bigger future because we're giving at least one more choice. Ultimately, we'll, we should have that in the hands of the user 100%, but right now we're just kind of, we're building it slowly. So hopefully in a couple of years, we'll be a little bit closer to that. Awesome, thanks. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn here. But yeah, Thomas, if you have any questions or wanna start that part of it, let me know. Awesome, thank you, Carrie. And I, I have at least one question queued up from Thomas, the man himself. Thomas, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Sure, thanks Thanks so much, Carrie. That was excellent. And I love New York too. I wanted <laughs> to ask you about, so you showed that um, pretty slick flow from on the Mac, turning on the dark theme preference and then it sure. updates. Does that, is that always done in the operating system on Windows, iOS, Android, Linux? Do you know if that has that same connection? For... Yeah, so I have an iPhone, so I, I can definitely see some settings in there. Sometimes they're app specific or site specific as well, so it depends, but there's all kinds of options. I think Windows was one of the first, had the high contrast mode built into the OS. It was one of the first ones. So now Apple and some of the other companies are, are catching up. So you can definitely have these different experiences. I just showed you, obviously, the version that I have on my desktop, but 
I think people are responding to that question too. They have another question, uh, hand raised from Mark. Mark. I know Mark. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hey, Harry. There you are. Hey, Mark. How are you? Good. Hey, I think Thomas may have asked the same question, but I may ask it differently. If you've designed that, if you've designed that SVG in and you're doing responsive web and you're reading it on a mobile device, do the accessibility settings also pertain to that reduced motion as well and they'll work or do you have to be thinking about anything else? So for both prefers color scheme and prefers reduced motion that you have as a user, you have to go in and choose those options for you to see that alternate experience. But as far as the pattern is concerned, you would hear the same thing that you would on desktop, if that makes sense. So if you're talking about just like the alternative information that you're getting uh, that would be the same experience throughout. You don't have to turn anything on for that. Obviously you need to be using like a screen reader or AT device, but you would hear it the same, but that, those other two are dependent on a user checking the box essentially. So you are as a developer and a designer deciding these are the two experiences I want to give for color. These are the two experiences I want to give for motion. And as a user, you get to choose based on your settings, which one you're going to encounter. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? It does. Question? Thank awesome. you, Mark. Carrie, there's a question from Hyojin. She said, thank you. And this is a good entry point for her as a someone new to accessibility. How does she measure measure contrast color contrast ratio in web content? I, I mentioned start and other plugins, but maybe you have other resources. Yeah. So it depends on if it's in code or if it's in a design that's not hard coded, right? I use the accessibility, what is it called? The color contrast analyzer from TPGI. I think that's a really great asset. A lot of the programs and design programs have some of those color contrast checkers built in. If you are going the code route or you have a code pen or a style guide or even something local, there's a lot of different options that you have. Like a lot of the automated checkers will catch certain things. You're only going to check like a hex on hex or a calculated hex on hex value. It's not going to check it against a gradient or against an image. So if you had text or something on that. So in the case of SVGs, really because it's an image, like if you don't have any text or anything that's in it, you're really counting the border against the background. And, and you want to spot check if like that changes somewhere along the line. So it is part art, part science, but that one tool from TPGI is golden because it can test things that automated checkers can't check, but simple things automated checkers could check. Or if you know the values, there's a lot of plug and play options and palette generators. There's, I, I don't want to get overwhelm you with all that, but maybe next time I do this talk, I'll, I'll definitely bust out a few of those, but there's a lot of different options for color contrast. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Carrie. There, does anyone else have questions? I, I have a question, but I want to give the floor to the attendees. Yeah, and Doug actually made a good point too uh, that I didn't mention this, but I mentioned the ID24 is that the prefers reduced motion, you can give somebody an additional way to turn it on or turn it off outside of your OS. And the same is true with the dark mode, light mode as well. It, you can do like a JavaScript toggle, essentially that it's utilizing one of the themes versus the other themes. So depending on how you want to offer that up, that might be an alternative or that might be an additional I think it gets a little confused. Sometimes I've seen some operating systems, like typically your operating system will be secondary to whatever is on the screen, but it depends on the operating system. So I don't know if Doug has, has run into that either, but sometimes my preference is ignored if I'm using the, the toggle on the website, for instance, which I guess is probably what you want it to do. So you, you might have some conflicting options at times. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. What kind of animation or like data visualization, like dynamic graphics work have you seen done with SVG in the wild oh, from an accessibility standpoint? Yeah, accessibility standpoint. I think one of the, the major players is high charts and the way that they do data visualization. Doug Shepherds is on the call and he is actually an expert on that topic as well. That's a little bit above my pay grade as far as the dynamic part. That's a lot of JavaScript that I don't want to do. But it's really interesting what they do. So High Charts, I know, has worked with Lucy Greco, the, the inventor of High Charts or creator of it. And they've done a lot to help support dynamic SVGs. A good example would be like if I have a graph with a bunch of data points, but I, I'm using a screen reader, how do I convey that much information and dynamically changing information 
to somebody who can't see the change visually, but can hear it. So it, maybe that's a the topic for Doug or somebody else like that to come in and, and talk more about that. But it's fascinating. Well, we, we're um, due to have yeah. Doug back Did- and high charts is a really good call out. I'm also curious about dynamic content, visualization, focus management. These are all things that we can do with ARIA and tab index and what have you. So it's really great to see that high charts is working in that space, especially as more and more content is digital in a education context, for example, that's really important. Yeah, it's um, a super popular platform still. It's used, I forget what the percentage is, but it's used by a lot. And there's some other one, nice. other players as well, but that's who I go to first. Awesome. What are some of the challenges to using SVG in this context? What use cases do you have for SVGs that are particularly robust? For, obviously, icons is one. Um, I think you, logo SVG, text. all the things, do it. Unless you're talking about photographs. I, again, if you check out the ID24 talk, I really compare like the pluses and minuses to the different formats. And they're... Uh, The chart that I created, oh man, I can find it real quick, but it's a checklist of resolution SVGs because again, it's code scales so well and in any platform, any device, right? It's not dependent on a lot of things. Sometimes it can be smaller weight, depending again on how complex it is. So that might be a, a plus. You can have additional information. Like you could, in theory, don't do this, but you could write a whole novel and pop it into an SVG and then serve it up to people uh, on AT devices. So you can jam pack it with like, all kinds of really great information. Plus, as we saw today, you can give these alternative experiences. If you wanted to do that with an image, let's say I'd have to create a dark mode and a light mode of that image and then link out to the appropriate one, which if you're doing one image, that's not a big deal. But if you've got thousands of images, on your site, you've doubled your work and never mind animation because animation, you're probably using like a GIF. And so then you're creating a completely different file for that kind of animation that you're wanting. So I think SVG solves a lot of problems when it comes to recycle, reduce and reuse or something. I don't know, but it's like one of those kind of concepts where images and GIFs and JPEGs, they have different pros and cons, but definitely fidelity and resolution and the adaptability of SVGs is unparalleled between all the image formats that we have right now. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm a fan of SVG as well. <laughs> I, I think I feel your enthusiasm, so I appreciate it. Yeah, there's, we, I was joking this morning with Ben Myers and uh, we said there's dozens of us that love SVGs. So I think I'm just <laughs> passionate about it because it's like, how often do you get to see visual code and have it working for you in such a complex way? It's just phenomenal. I'm impressed. Yeah. I, and, and they're I old. They're of, like 1999. It's not. Biology. I know you see it like in the XMLS attribute, 1999. So <laughs> what, one of the things that's actually interesting about SVG and I'm just kind of riffing here is that it's just vanilla. It's, it's not HTML, but it follows like a uh, browser standards that adhere to some HTML behaviors. Mm-hmm. So for example, something that's cool about SVG is that you can link to a section of an SVG. Mm-hmm. So if you add an anchor to an SVG, element, then you can deep link into a visualization, stuff like that, that just blows my mind. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I, obviously for demo purposes, I wanted to show something pretty simple and that everyone could come away from this and then maybe look at the code pen after and just really pick it apart instead of going fast like I did, but just see like the oh, differences in comparing yeah. the like steps because it's not rocket science and you all can do basic SVG integration. And it just takes a little bit of time, but like anything accessibility, right? You learn how to do it once it becomes a trick in your tool bag and you don't have to really think about it anymore. It's just something that you do and you've given more options for your users, which is always a good thing. Related to that, what tools do you know of for exporting SVG that's like more editable than others, right? Because you got something off Wiki Commons, but if I wanted to get something out of like Illustrator or Sketch or no, yeah, I export as the SV as long as you can export as the SVG file. Like for Illustrator, I build a lot of SVGs from scratch, and then I just export it. And you can 
then open the SVG. Like I cheat a little bit. I open it into the, like a browser and then I right click inspect and I can grab it then. Oh, cool. Otherwise when you export it, you can actually press a button, at least on Illustrator, this is like show code. So depending on what platform you're using, you usually can grab it pretty easily. And then you can do whatever you want with it. So again, anything that you're exporting it from is probably not going to be accessible out of the box. It's probably going to give you weird ID numbers and letters, and you probably want to make it a little bit more user-friendly if you're going to be modifying it within the code. Because there's, trust me, there's been times where I, I get to an SVG and I'm like, okay, which one was like P1280? Like which one again was that? And then you have to reverse engineer it to figure out what you're modifying. So it's easier if you just say heart and then in your mind, hey, this is associated with this particular shape of the SVG. Because that's essentially what you are doing with the SVGs is like putting together a bunch of shapes. And depending on how they lay on each other, you're going to see different you know, outcomes. That's Mm. the short and long of it. And now I should have demoed a little bit longer. These are all great questions, but (laughs) putting me on the spot, I'm sure I'll think of something later. So definitely follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn and and let me know what I forgot. (laughs) I'll definitely add it the next time I talk. Yeah, Thomas, do you have other questions on your mind? Do we have any other questions in chat that I'm missing? Yeah, I'll just have one last one that's maybe also a discussion one too, but I I think it's interesting. The name prefers reduced motion, like reduced versus no motion Mm -hmm. as a discussion point. And I'm just curious if you had any thoughts on if you were going for reduced, like what's appropriate to be reduced. So I think you will always do well if you decide to produce no motion. So Mm -hmm. reduced meaning none. But I do know there are some users that like a little bit of motion or slowed down motion. So I can't talk obviously for them, but I err on the side of caution because why would I want to make someone sick who is like trying to buy my product or, you know, check out my blog post or something like, I don't want to do that. But I do like the idea of what Tatiana was talking about, flipping that on its head a little bit and serving up as the first option, no motion, and then adding the motion on if I had Uh, not check that. So it's a nuance, but it's really important. But yeah, that's what I think. I hope in the future, maybe we'll have a middle ground, but right now we only have, it's pretty one or the other. There used to be one, I think that was on prefers reduced motion that had the middle ground. I can't remember which one that was. I'll see if I can find it real quick in my notes. Let me see. No, I don't remember. I think that was on color contrast on color contrast. They have an additional kind of third one, but it's only supported by 12% of the browser which is like no preference on your color scheme. So for reduced motion, we only have that, the two that I know of. Yeah, I think I've observed ones where more on the Mac, but where the difference is so subtle and it's not actually like you're explaining it. So it's almost like I can barely tell that it's a reduced motion to the designer. It felt reduced, but it's still to Mm. me like animated. So yeah. Yeah. When it, when in doubt, I know what's the harm, what's the harm in making it not have any animation, but there is a harm to having some animation or full animation. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a gambler like that, I guess, (laughs) but yeah, just one thought. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Thank you so much for having me on and hopefully It was uh, entertaining or maybe educational to a few of people uh, listening. And uh, yeah, there's plenty of people in the SVG space. So definitely check them out as well. So lots of really smart people. Yeah. And Carrie has, if I can advocate on your behalf a little, you've done a lot of writing on Smashing Magazine about this topic. Great resources. Carrie's super active in this space. So please check out. Do you, have you written a book yet, Carrie? About accessibility. <laughs> I have not. I don't know that there's well, a book to write, but <laughs> if and when you do, we'll be looking for it. 